<laughs> we'll see. Well, we, I think we are live on YouTube. I see this live button. Are we live yet? That's live. Yeah, please share host to UMT because yes, they are yes, waiting. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes, I know. Yeah, we are communicating with them. Mm -mm. So when people are not speaking, please remember to mute your microphones. You can do that by going to the top right hand corner of your own little screen. There's a little three okay, dots. Guys. We are live. We are live. All right. Yeah. Well then, good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are to folks tuning in around the globe. Welcome to the Society for Conservation Biology Malaysia chapter World Turtle Day Open House. My name is Nick Pilcher and I'll be your moderator for this session. And today we are amongst sea turtle giants. Uh, an honor for me to say not just sea turtle giants, but but very, very good friends for a long time. And you might be wondering why some uh, foreigner person would moderate a Malaysian legacy panel. Uh, and let me just say that I, I'm, I'm somewhat of an adopted Malaysian myself. Um, my wife is Malaysian, my children are Malaysian, my NGO is a Malaysian NGO. Uh, and although it took a while, I, I have permanent resident status now in Malaysia. So you can't get rid of me that easily. <laughs> but enough about me. Uh, the idea of this panel is to revisit some of the, uh, the challenges, uh, some of the personalities, the lessons learned, uh, and the legacies left behind by the people you can see here on your screen um, from those very early pioneering days in Malaysia. A couple of uh, housekeeping points first. Uh, for those of you who will be following us online via YouTube, as and how you have questions, please drop them in the comments box down below as they do on YouTube. And, uh, and I think I'm supposed to say, don't forget to subscribe and sign up for notifications or something like that. That's how YouTube goes. And we will have all of the panelists speak first, and then I will address the questions later on when we're all done. Um, we'll process that towards the end, and I, and I hope you can all stay with us during that time. So with that, I'd like to just very briefly introduce the panelists. I'll say a little bit more about each of them as we go through the, the afternoon. But we have Prof Chan uh, in the middle of the screen. She is uh, Malaysia's leading turtle lady. Uh, top uh, left in your screen, you have Dato, Dr. Dino Sharma, uh, basically just an all around good guy. Um, and then just below him, you have uh, Dr. Jeannie Mortimer who is, uh, in my opinion, island turtle lady and also an amazing scientist. Um, the, gentleman, the other gentleman with the beard <laughs> is Dr. Cole Limpus, uh, basically just global legend, and I, I'd like to leave it at that. He's, he's taught me more than I could ever tell you about sea turtles, and, and he's just an amazing character. And in the top right, we have Prof Maslan, uh, who is a remigrant turtle having been a turtle person once and, and now re-migrated back to the fore. Um, and so these are our panelists for today. We have some technical people in the room as well, Health and Seling, who will be helping out with uh, comments and chats and things like that. So this is about the legacy period, those early days in Malaysia. And, and I kind of find myself in the middle generation. There are, there are a whole team of young Malaysians sort of that have emerged from those days. And, um, and I sort of came as, as Jeannie was leaving, um, but our paths never crossed back then. Uh, but let me tell you that these panelists combined have something like two centuries worth of experience on sea turtle biology and conservation. Uh, and, and they know exactly what it was like. Uh, their knowledge dates back to the days when most of our listeners were thinking about another day in primary school. Um, and, and they set the scene. They, they laid the foundations, they designed the road that we follow. And for any of you who follow Sam the Cooking Guy on YouTube, now we say, and now we follow. So that's what we're gonna do. I'd like to start out by calling on Prof Chan um, because she is uh, just Malaysia's number one person in terms of sea turtles. 
She's a retired professor from University of Malaysia, Trangano, and she devoted the greater part of her working life on sea turtles, starting with leatherbacks, back in Rantawabang, green hawksbill turtles, and redang, and finally terrapins in situ and a number of other places. She pioneered turtle volunteer work in Malaysia and founded the Turtle Sanctuary on Redung Island. And these are things that took ages and ages to do and co-founded the Sea Turtle Conservation Society of Malaysia. She was inducted to UNEP's Global 500 in 2003. And in 2019, she received the ISTS Lifetime Achievement Award. She's currently president of the Turtle Conservation Society uh, of Malaysia. So with that, I'd like to ask a couple of questions. And I, I'd like to start by why turtles? And can you tell us a little bit about those early days? Over to you, Prof Chan. Why turtles? Huh? You know, a lot of people told me I did not choose the turtle, but the turtles chose me. <laughs> because honestly, I never I never had a turtle in my childhood. You know, I, I never thought about turtles. I just came into them when I was transferred to Trangano. So that was how it was. And um, well, since then, it has, things have just been great. You know, I never stopped working on turtles after the first day. And um, what was, was it another question? Yeah, tell us, tell us about those early days. How oh, did sure. it all start? Oh yeah, that was way back in the 1980s. But before that, let, let me do some, you know, some other stuff first. I would first of, of course like to thank you, Nick, for such a nice introduction and to the organizers for inviting me to share my experiences. And uh, of course, I would like to say hi to everybody out there who's tuned in to our channel here. Um, before I start my story, I would like to credit a few people who have sort of laid the foundations for my leatherback turtle work in Trangano. Now, firstly, the late Professor Balasingam. I do not know whether any of you have heard of him before. And uh, Mr. Xiao Kwan Tao, who was once the fisheries director of Trangano. Now, these two people, they published a paper each way back in the 1960s. And because of the data that I could get from those two early papers, I was able to demonstrate the dramatic, dramatic decline of the leatherback turtles, even back in the 1980s. Can you imagine back in the 1980s, the, the decline was already 95%. It was really, it was a shocker to me, you know, when I discovered that. Okay, next, I would like to uh, acknowledge Mr. Lee Chong Lui, who was instrumental in helping me to secure a grant from ESO, and that enabled me to do a lot of my turtle work in Trungan. Then the late Professor Aki Ka. In those early days, I knew nothing about turtles. So I had consulted him, and he had really given me such invaluable advice on what I could, I could or could not do you know, in my attempts to work on leatherback turtles. And I'd like to acknowledge Colin. Colin, do you remember? You came to yes. my office way back in the 1980s and you taught me how to sex newly emerged hatchlings by looking at the histological slides prepared from the gonads. I will not forget that because that enabled me to do quite a bit of work on sex ratio studies, not only on leatherback turtles, but on the other species as well including freshwater turtles. Thank you, Colin. And now my story. It actually started in the mid 1980s after I was transferred to Trungano from the main campus of UPM in Serdang. Uh, shortly after I moved there, the uh, director of fisheries in Trungano at that time, Mr. Ibrahim Saleh, I don't know if any of you know him. Inche Ibrahim Saleh, okay.
Prof Chang? So came to the university and told us that they were getting embarrassingly low hatch rates in the hatchery. And uh, he wanted one of us from the university to go and see what we could do, you know, to help bring up the hatch rates and so on. And uh, I was assigned to that task. And at that time, you know, in the I think we have lost uh, Prof Chan's audio. Prof Chan, can you hear me? Prof Chan, it, can you hear me? Her screen is blank to me, Nick. Yeah, yeah, it's just all gone solid. Um, let's, Health, can you send Chan a message? and ask her to rejoin this message, this chat, please. Yes, yes, on it now. Okay, and in the meantime, all right, and we'll come back to Chan, but we have a whole bunch of people that can continue this great story. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to call on Dino, if you don't mind, um, because your experience in Malaysia goes back more decades than I want to tell everybody. <laughs> um, and, and I kind of I kind of like the fact that you evolved from being um, a beach field guy to the CEO of WWF Malaysia, and and there's got to be there's got to be a great story there, right? From from sort of sand, sandals on the beach to to corporate attire in the office, absolutely amazing. Um, maybe you could share some of the some of that story and some of the memories and some of the challenges. Sure, sure. So yeah, first, first of all, thank you to the Society of Conservation Biology for organizing this forum. I think it's fantastic. Uh, apart from anything else, it's given me a chance to say hello to Jean and Prof Chan and Colin. Uh, I knew I could never ever match up to the scientific caliber of Colin. So I decided to try and keep a beard instead and look like him. <laughs> and I'm still trying. <laughs> He's, he looks more groovy than me. So anyway, I, I joined. WWF Malaysia in January 1990. I think I made an impression on the then Director of Conservation, uh, Dr. Dr. Mike Kavanagh, whom I think Gene remembers well as well. And, uh, and I told him I was keen to work on turtle conservation. And so I was assigned to run a model turtle hatchery at the Leatherback Turtle Rookery at Rantau Abang. Uh, so I had this small little place of beach up north from Rantau Abang called Jambu Bongko. Um, and that was where we set up a small hatchery and tried to look at um, better ways to manage a hatchery from a scientific point of view. I mean, you know, the folks there were all locals and they were you know, harvesting the eggs, burying them, but I think they, they lacked uh, science in what they were doing. So the work that uh, Colin had done and Jean and others were actually brought out to, to the East Coast to try and educate the fisheries, uh, turtle managers, as I call them, uh, how to better apply science to the management. Uh, WWF had just run a Save the Sea Turtle campaign in the late 1980s and the idea was to raise uh, public awareness and, and to raise funds for turtle conservation. So I was very fortunate to be able to learn as much as I could from uh, Dr. Jean Mortimer, who at the time was hired by WWF Malaysia to assess the turtle nesting populations across the states where turtles used to nest. Uh, I remember we hired a field house in uh, Ranta Abang. Uh, and we, that became our, our house where we operated. I had a little motorbike. I used to drive up and down the beach, uh, going up to my hatchery. Uh, I, I, there was not assigned a car, for example. And uh, Jean, uh, Jean, you know, Jean was a great teacher. Uh, you know, always, uh, you know, uh, resourceful, always smiling, uh, very generous with her knowledge, uh, making available reprints uh, from the journals. Uh, you know, you're always stuck in Trangani, you can't find reprints, and Jean always has this whole stack of stuff. But communications was a challenge. I mean, uh, we had no cell phone, mind you. There was the days before cell phones was, you could have, now you have two or three cell phones and all that. Uh, we had no phone in the field house. We had to drive away to find a serviceable phone because everything along the way was vandalized. <laughs> so that, that was how difficult it was uh, to even to communicate. I mean, call back home, the office was a challenge. Yeah? Um, I was pretty shocked, to be honest, uh, once the nesting season began. Uh, because the whole place, along Ranta Abang, was transformed into a beach carnival. 
people were camping on the beach at night, singing, playing loud music, selling food. And this was right in front of the main area that where the chalets were, yeah? And I was equally shocked to see eggs being harvested at those volumes and sold openly for human consumption. So I knew immediately that apart from ecology and science and all the publications in journals, that we had a huge problem. And the problem was to, to bring all of that in ways that mattered to local communities, to people that had long traditions, long practices, long cultures, long beliefs that the eggs were, you know, of course, a cheap source of protein, but they had aphrodisiac properties and they could cure asthma and a whole list of stuff that they believed in. And, and so we, we, you know, science is fine. Science has to continue, but applying science into management and then the next step getting into to the places where people could understand it and then beyond understanding and awareness, they could then hopefully participate in conservation. I think that was the, the key challenge we had, yeah? So two things I won't forget whilst I was at Rantawabang. Uh, seeing my first leatherback turtle was simply amazing. I must tell you this. So I was at Jumbo Bonko one night and a female was coming up from the sea uh, waterline and I decided to, to remain so still like a rock, which I did. And, and she came up right up to me and uh, it was 3 a.m. I remember this very vividly. And she started to eventually dig a, a, a hole to lay her eggs. And, uh, and I, I tried to not move at all. And eventually, I was being sprayed by sand. I was had sand all over my eyes, my face, my ears, my nose. I had literally slept through the whole thing. She had already laid the eggs, and she was covering up the nest, and she was then spraying the sand all over me. And that was really amazing to be sitting all alone by the leatherback. And, oh, and of course, I saw 18 leatherbacks in one night uh, in, 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 the, in those years. Uh, nowadays, as we know, the story for Ranta Abang, uh, you know, uh, it is impossible to see a leatherback. None have been nesting for, for so many years, yeah? The, the, the local people that we hired, I hear a phone ringing. The local people that we hired were fantastic. I mean, they helped us a lot in what we were doing, but one of the key challenges I had was that when we were about to dig up the egg clutches, we had nests that were tagged and numbered and we knew how many eggs they were in and so on and so forth. But there were many nests where there were actually no eggs inside. People had stolen the eggs. So, you know, it was very irresistible to locals who just loved the eggs, yeah? So I, you know, I was, I was, I what I do, but um, one such evening, rather unfortunately, I was hit by a lorry while I was heading to, to work in the, in the hatchery. And I fell off my motorbike. Uh, my bike was really badly damaged. I had to pick myself up, bleeding and all, and drive myself to the nearest hospital in Dungun. I was told that my ligaments were torn, so I had to be sent back to Kuala Lumpur, where I, my leg was put into a plaster of Paris, a cast for three months. And that was it. That was my, my chance to continue working on the leather back turtles. Um, I, was, I was sent away to Borneo to study proboscis monkeys but came back to work more on turtles in uh, Madeira and helped set up a turtle sanctuary in Madeira. So, uh, but most of my work has been in the Sertiu wetlands where I, I worked on uh, olive trees because in the 1970s, in 1978, 76, and, and subsequently 1980s, and in 1990, Professor Edward Moll from the Eastern Illinois University uh, wrote a series of reports recommending for the Sertiu area to be gazetted as a wildlife sanctuary for olive ridley turtles and for painted terrapins. Uh, and its report was in 1990. When I had done my work in 1993 and did a follow-up recommendation plan to set up a sanctuary, basically there was almost no olive ridleys at all. I mean, they were just on the tail end. And I, I feel very sad, but I, I want to tell you one thing about this gentleman called Colin Limpers, and he'll speak for himself afterwards. Uh, and I'll end by this, this one thing. I'm just going to read something off his introduction of a report Colin wrote to the Fisheries of the Department of Malaysia in 1993. And he says, and I, and I, and I repeat what he says. Um, so his report was called Recommendations for the Conservation of Marine Turtles in Peninsular Malaysia. And he says, uh, past conservation practices have been insufficient to maintain stable populations in the face of active egg harvest 
there is an urgent need for some new and decisive conservation action if the Malaysian leatherbacks and olive leaf turtles are to be saved. But he says, in the final analysis, however, the fate of all Malaysian marine turtle populations is dependent on political will and political decisions. And we can speak volumes about that. And I'll take a pause for now. One, one quick question before I let you go. Thank you. That, this is some great stories and sorry about the motorcycle. Uh, <laughs> but, but what would you say to today's generation? Uh, any priorities that you can pinpoint to, to give them a couple of words of wisdom and guidance? Yeah, so not just on turtles, but on the other things I've worked on, I, I, I came quickly to realize that it is all well and fine to do research and isolate yourself in academia and publish. Uh, and that's good. And science, uh, cutting edge science is good. And, and we need to, uh, conservation must be informed from solid science. Uh, but very quickly, we must remember that a lot of these uh, animals live in and around places where there are local communities. And one cannot overestimate uh, the need to ensure that you very quickly understand the communities where you do your conservation work and very quickly find ways and methods to bring them on board in ways that they understand, Look, using local language, local culture, tradition, using new means to bring conservation messaging to them through plays and music and poetry and art and anything. So always remember, the science is important, but involvement of local communities must be a very important facet of the work you do on the ground. Thank you. Um for the for the uh, audience, there was that so we we had a slight technical hiccup, and and uh, Prof Chan had to run away and come back, and I asked uh, Dino to stand in, and and I just wanted to this is after the fact, but at least so that people know where you're coming from. Um, for those of you out there around the world, uh, Dino uh, was formerly the CEO of WWF Malaysia and has um, over thirty years conservation and management experience in Malaysia. And he started out his early days in Rantawaban, as you heard. Um, I didn't know the story about the motorcycle and the accident. I'm sorry to hear. Um, but he's now retired from there. He's currently a director at a number of institutions, an advisor, a director to the Malaysian Wildlife Conservation Foundation, strategic advisor and council member of Green Growth Asia Foundation, and a board member of more things than I can read about in the space of time we've got. But Dino, uh, on top of being a, a amazing, amazing conservationist in Malaysia, um, made me feel really, really welcome when I had, when I arrived and, and we've been friends ever since. And so um, you have my personal gratitude for that. Thanks. And and Prof Chan, it's so nice to see you back. And, uh, and I'm sorry about the slight technical hiccups, but if you can remember where you stopped, We'd, be, we'd love to hear the rest of the story. Okay. Um, I think I said I started work on the beach in Ranta Abang because I was supposed to look at the hatchery operations, how the work was being done and how the eggs were being handled and all that. So I had to spend nights and nights out there observing the workers and seeing what they were doing and so forth. And I was subjected to the kind of chaos that Dino was talking about, you know, the tourists, you know, the people coming to watch the turtles and, oh my God, it was, it was like a living hell to me, you know, to see the poor leatherback turtles, you know, they were impeded, you know, as they went back to the beach because, because the, the person who had collected the money, he would take a very, very long bamboo, you know, and prevent the leatherback turtle from going back to the ocean so that more people could come and look at it. It was terrible, terrible, terrible. And amidst all that chaos, I, continued doing my observations and all that. So I, um, I worked on ha handling techniques and so on. I, I discovered that um, one of the main reasons, you know, was the long lapse of time between the eggs, you know, the time when the eggs were laid and the time when they were brought back to the hatchery for incubation. And uh, the eggs were so roughly handled. <laughs> they just allow the eggs, you know, from the sand on top, you know, just allow it to roll and, and fall into the nest cavity. It was 
And they said that the turtle, you know, when the turtle laid the egg, it dropped that kind of that, you know, so why not, you know? But then that was immediately after laying. So then I, I worked out some experiments and all that, and I published a paper and I was able to demonstrate that it was the rough handling and the long time lapse between egg laying and the translocation that had caused the low hatch rates. And um, I hope that they had taken note of that. Um, so in those early days, you know, I was, I was very new to turtle research. I started reading everything I could lay my hands on. And it wasn't easy those days. Huh? We did not have internet and all that. We had to write, send requests or reprints on little postcards, you know, and then wait until the papers came and so on. I devoured each paper as they came. But um, the most shocking fact, you know, I discovered was how the leatherbacks had declined even way back in the 1980s. It was horrible. And I felt that I needed to get this information out to the local authorities, out to the local government. But how? I'm just a mere lecturer in a university and quite a young lecturer as well. So that was when the funds from ESO came in very handy. I started producing brochures, why the leatherback turtles are disappearing, what you can do you know, to help save turtles and so on. So I produced a lot of those brochures and some of them came into the hands of the people in the state secretariat, the state government. And uh, so, I, so I was called you know, to meet them and all that. And I, you know, I cannot imagine the disbelief on their face when they looked at the steep decline of the leatherback turtles. So, um, so I guess those brochures were pretty effective because it moved the state government to form the Turtle Century Advisory Council and to revise the turtle enactment to include turtle watching rules and to ban the sale and consumption of leatherback eggs. Okay, so from um, issues on the beach, I realized that I could not just work on the beach. I must go beyond, you know, to study more and to find out more about why the turtles are declining. So I went out to look at issues in the ocean. But how to do that? Luckily, I had this uh, marine turtle research manual, I think. So they suggested there to interview fishermen. So, yeah, fishermen, the fishing activities was one of the major threats. And um, so I carried out a statewide interview involving fishermen operating different kinds of fishing gear. The findings are fully documented in the paper, which, which, which I published. And the trawl nets and bottom gill nets were identified to be the major culprits. Uh, later on, you know, many, many years later, I had a chance to go to Taiwan and uh, to talk to the Taiwan uh, turtle scientist there. And uh, he told me, you know, that he understood why the leatherback turtles in Trungganu and Malaysia had declined so much. Because he went on to some of these um, offshore, you know, those um, drift nets, the offshore drift nets, the high seas drift nets. He said he used to follow them and he said, you cannot imagine, you know, the number of leatherback turtles that had been killed in those high seas drift nets. But that was in international waters, not within Malaysian waters. Okay, now, now once I identified the type of gears, you know, that were detrimental to turtles within our territorial waters, I asked myself next, you know, what can I do after this, you know? You know what the threats are. So I, I was thinking like, okay, maybe we have to, um, identify the offshore nesting, uh, the offshore habitats, where the turtles were, where did they go in between each nesting? Turtles nest about five, six times, you know? So the internesting period, where are they, you know? So, um, so I started this radio tracking study uh, with, a, with a grant from the Malaysian government. And uh, in those days, Scott and Karen Ackert, they were doing radio tracking work. And I consulted them, you know, on how do you attach the radio transmitters on turtles and so on. And they responded by offering to come and work with me. It was, it was, it was really wonderful. So they came and we worked together and we managed to identify the offshore uh, habitats of leatherbacks. And uh, subsequently the fisheries department declared, you know, the, the particular area that we had identified to be an offshore sanctuary. But of course, for the offshore sanctuary to be effective, there needs to be, um, you know, monitoring and surveillance work, which I think was quite lacking. Okay, so um, so so this was the kind of work that I did, and um, 
I was quite lucky, you know, because every time I sought help somewhere, the help just came very generously. And uh, so I managed to publish quite a few papers on the leatherback turtles, and I eventually put all of them together into a thesis, which I submitted to the Kagoshima University. And I got my doctorate through the Rontaku program. Okay. Now, uh, what are the kind of challenges I faced during those early days? Yeah, I was, I was young. I was in my 30s, you know. I had a full-time job as a lecturer in the university. I was also a full-time mother <laughs> to two very young children. I think Colin and Jean, you may remember them. <laughs> and um, I was also a full-time wife. No, no, no more now. And I had no research assistant. <laughs> you know? Therefore, I had to do a lot of juggling those early years. But as I said earlier on, I was young. I was full of energy and I think I was full of passion, you know, to find out what had caused the dramatic decline of the mighty leatherbacks and how I might set up to help save these gentle giants. So I just did the best I could in my capacity and um, no looking back really. And uh, after the leatherbacks, I went on to work Green and Hotspur Turtles in Redang Island, founded the Turtle Sanctuary there and started the volunteer programs and so on. And then also uh, brought the public you know, to participate in turtle conservation. Now, before I finish, I would like to briefly mention the Turtle Sanctuary Advisory Council of Chungdani. Now this was formed in, I think about 1987 or 1988 by the state government of Chungdani. And I think, do you know you attended quite a few of those meetings, yeah? <laughs> So it was chaired by the state secretary and all stakeholders, including the state fisheries department, the federal fisheries department, WWF, Prohimitan, etc. They were all represented. And I served in the council as a representative of the university from its inception till the year I retired, which was in the year 2009. Quite a few years before you, you know. <laughs> okay, then um, the council actually provided a very good platform for me to submit my findings. And the most of the ideas I proposed in the meetings, actually they were, they were accepted, except one. One proposal to extend the ban, of, the ban and consumption of uh, eggs, turtle eggs to all the species, that was not accepted. And that was my biggest challenge. And that was my failure. That was my failure. I could not get the state government, but I hear now that they are looking into it. And I, I was very happy to know that. So, so what I did, to stop people from eating turtle eggs, I started a signature campaign. I started a signature campaign to get individual members of the public to make a pledge and to sign that they will not eat turtle eggs for the rest of their life. Collected quite a fair, fair number of uh, signatures and I submitted it to the, uh, to the Ministry of the South of Chungganu. But uh, still, there wasn't any action taken. But hopefully, in, in, in the next few months, we see some, some things going. Uh, thank you. I think this is all I have to say. Thank you, Chan. You, you've got um, so much history walking around with you and you've got so much knowledge on, on where things were in Malaysia. And you leave uh, some very, very large shoes to fill for all of the young Malaysians coming up behind you. Um, just one quick question before I let you go. And is there anything that, that you think we should be prioritizing now Anything that you'd like to see the young new turtle people working on now that, that would make a big difference? Um, I think um, education is very important. Getting the knowledge out to the public at large, because it is not just scientists you know, and conservationists that should be doing the work. I think everybody has got a role and a responsibility. So I think uh, getting people involved so that they understand, you know, they understand what we go through, how difficult it is, and and they, they would dig deeper into their pockets to help people who are doing the work. Okay. Thank you so so much. Really, um, can't tell you how much how how much of a pleasure it is to hear all of this. Um, I'm going to keep the session rolling, and introduce uh, Dr. Jeannie Mortimer from the U.S., who is a um, sea turtle conservation biologist who's worked internationally for 
you know, across multiple countries and multiple years. But her link to Malaysia is that back in 1989 through to 1982, um, she did a contract um, with WWF Malaysia and Department of Fisheries Malaysia to train personnel and, um, and produce management plans for sea turtles that are still relevant to this very day. Um, and she came back in 2012, didn't tell me, so I'm quite upset, um, to help WWF, WWF Malaysia with their Malacca turtle program. She's lived in the Seychelles since 1995, but, but travels extensively um, and knows an incredible amount about sea turtles. So Jean, I'd love to call on you now and just to, uh, you know, you, you knew things back then uh, maybe you've been back since then, so you, you've got some before and after stories you'd like to tell, um, and 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 just regale us with all of that incredible history. Uh, well, my um, my my first um, visit to Malaysia was in nineteen actually in nineteen eighty eight. Um, I had been hired by um, World Wildlife Fund in U.S. to go to Thailand and do a uh, consultancy there for about a month. And then uh, they said, oh, and by the way, why don't you just go down to Malaysia for a few days and see what's going on down there and see if, you know, maybe you can offer some, some help. So when I went down, um, I was uh, able to meet, um, it was, I, that was in, uh, in 88, I um, uh, visited uh, uh, Chan Nang Heng's uh, project. And of course, she already was, you know, very well uh, had a well-developed project of, of research, and she understood what was what was going on um, with with the with the turtles, and was already you know gathering a lot of data. Um, and uh, I think we we did we visit we visited uh, Chen when I was there. I think we visited the uh, fisheries department uh, uh, at that at that time also. Uh, and then I went across to the other coast, to the uh, Malacca coast, and I uh, was met I met Kevin Hugh. Who I was hoping was going to be on this session, but I guess not. Uh, and um, went out to, to Malacca and was looking at their hatchery, which was actually located out on uh, an island. I think it was on uh, Pulau Upe, if I remember right. But um, uh, and so then I, I came back and I I wrote up a, a pro they, the people at WDF Malaysia asked me if I'd write a proposal, you know, suggesting what kind of work needed to be done in the country. And I, I did, and uh, then they hired me to implement it. And so I, uh, I took on a two-year contract, which turned into a three-year contract. And my job was really to, uh, I think one way to describe it is to kind of sell sea turtle conservation to the, uh, to the governments. And I was working on a project, uh, my funding came from um, WWF Malaysia, um, but I was, I was also working with the fisheries department. And I was working throughout the uh, peninsular Malaysia. And my job was really to, you know, to visit uh, the fisheries people who were responsible for the turtles in each of the states. And uh, I, in a way, I felt a little bit like a salesman. I'd show up in an office and try to get them interested in turtles if they weren't already there. And then uh, we conducted, uh, working with the fisheries people, we'd go out and uh, conduct uh, field surveys of the nesting populations. and. Um, and come up with recommendations for for the state, and I, you know, I'd be training people uh, in the fisheries department, and of course, I was also training people in World Wildlife Fund Malaysia, among whom was Dino, uh, one of my very best students. <laughs> Dino had long hair at that time that came down to his shoulders. Now he's got a long beard that comes down to his shoulders, but um, uh, but when I uh, one thing that uh, struck me when I uh, took the job was the focus of, from the authorities, as, as Chan has already said, was leatherbacks. You know, we must save the leatherbacks. And I could kind of see that, you know, the leatherbacks were going to be pretty hard to save at that point. Um, but, my, you know, I, I, I made a big point at the time of trying to get them interested in, in um, uh, protecting the other species of turtles that were nesting there, especially, you know, greens and, and um, uh, olive ridleys and, and some hawksbills. And, and um, uh, they actually went from protecting almost none to protecting uh, a, a fair number. I think at that time it was going up to, you know, the, close to 50% uh, of the eggs that were 
reported eggs that were being protected in the hatcheries. Um, so I felt that was one of you know my 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 most important contributions. But uh, you know clearly there was still more to be done because people didn't see they didn't they didn't make the connection between. Um, you know, that uh, if you have a lot of turtles nesting now, that doesn't mean you're okay. You, you know, you need to realize that the turtles you see nesting now hatched out of eggs years ago. And if you're not producing hatchlings uh, now, you're not gonna have uh, adults coming back later. So, um, uh, and then I was also fortunate to be able to go out to, uh, to visit Sabah and Sarawak and, and look at the, the projects out there and, you know, tried to make, make some recommendations out there. Um, I think one of the one of the points I was trying to push in 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 Sabah was that uh, you know we maybe didn't need to have quite so much hatchery if the island was uh, isolated, and you know it, it's good to let the um, uh, let the turtles uh, uh, hatch their own you know dig their eggs and incubate in natural natural circumstances, um, but. Um, uh, and then, as, as uh, Nick mentioned, I, I came back to Malaysia uh, in, uh, in 2012, and I think that was largely uh, Dino who uh, invited me to come back and help with their um, Malacca pr uh, project. And I was, I was very interested in, in, in Malacca, especially because I, I have a special um, love for hawksbills. Um, I did the IUCN uh, uh, red listing uh, assessment for hawksbills in 2008 with Mary Del Donnelly. And uh, you know, here in Seychelles, I work a lot with hawksbills. It's one of the you know global hawksbill centers, really. Um, and um, so we were looking at, in 2012. We were looking at the situation with hawksbills in in Malacca. Uh, oh, I, I might say too that we, under my project in the in between 89 and 92, we uh, we kind of discovered you know that uh, when people already people already knew there were hawksbills nesting and they were collecting the eggs. But it was working with the fisheries department, we discovered really how important the population of hawksbills that was in Malacca. And um, it remains one of the, well, as of last I checked, one of the, the two biggest populations uh, in Malaysia, one being in, in uh, Sabah and the other one being in Malacca. And uh, what struck me when I was there in 2012 was that uh, you know, there's so much development along the coastline of Malacca. It's a very difficult task to try to maintain the habitat. And so I'd actually, I'm actually anxious to hear from, from people uh, maybe uh, you know, uh, in this group, what, what's happening in, that, in there, because I haven't been out there since. But um, um, anyway, most of, my, most of my focus really now is, is in the Western Indian Ocean. And, uh, but I still, I, I still love Malaysia. And I really miss the food and, uh, and the people. And so that's really, I guess, all I really want to say for now. Thank you, Jean. And, and, and that, that sort of brought me right to my very last question, uh, which is something that will ring true to all Malaysians that are following this. And it's a question that we could not escape from asking, but what was your favorite food from Malaysia? Oh, you know what? I, I, I right now I can't remember the the, um, the name exactly, but it was a uh, a noodle, a rice noodle dish that came with um, with the sauce on top. Um, uh, if I heard the yeah, name, we have, I we have about six hundred of those. I know, I know. So that's a, that's a mean question when I've been away so long, trying not to think about the food actually because I get too hungry. <laughs> Well, thank, thank you, Jean, for sharing, sharing your points, and we'll, we'll come back to you a little bit later on. And, uh, and I'm going to keep the ball rolling and, uh, and move on to Prof. Masan, yeah, uh, thank you. Who's, who's sitting very quietly in the top <laughs> right-hand corner of my screen, um, and, and who is no stranger to sea turtles in the slightest, having started out working uh, back in 1986 under the guidance of Prof. Chan and uh, Liu Hok Chak where he got his bachelor's degree at UPM. I believe it yeah. was University of Pertanian, Malaysia back then. Yeah. No, um, there. And he went on to complete a PhD at the University of Wales um, and has published hundreds of papers and supervised whole new generations of Malaysian scientists. Um, he's from Trangano, which is uh, yeah. one of Malaysia's big, big uh, sea turtle centers. And he started his undergraduate work back there at uh, U University Putra, is it? Or 
Pertanian. Anyway, now Putra, uh, before now Putra, Putra, Pertanian, yeah. Um, but on what was a campus that is now University of Malaysia of Trangano. Um, and so he started out doing turtle work, moved on to working on fish, yeah. and in 2014 came back to University of Malaysia of Trangano, which is why right at the beginning I called him a re-migrant <laughs> because he finally came home. Um, but if you don't mind, Prof, I'd like to, yeah. to just um, ask a couple of questions. And, yeah, and you started yeah. out doing field work right back in the 80s when when people hadn't even thought about turtle work. And I'm, I'm imagining that things were a little bit raw around the edges and a little bit difficult. Yes, I'd yes. love to hear some stories from back then. Thank you, Nick. First of all, I would like to thank to this, uh, the society the conservation society biological society of Malaysia for inviting me for this platform today and also of course all you know uh, the colleagues today uh, we met you know old friends uh, Dr. Jean, Prof. Jeans, uh, uh, colleagues you know Nick and Dino Sharma and Prof. Chan of course my Sifu before it was started in you know when I first graduated in 1985 Remember that time, it was a very serious economic recession, Prof Chan. Eh? Then uh, Prof Chan, uh, being a uh, you know, local Itangano, so Prof Chan invited me. And of course, uh, Mr. Liu, our chair was my supervisor. And they invited me to join uh, because they just got, uh, as Prof Chan mentioned, they just got uh, SO grant, about 80K, Prof Chan, eh? about 80K at that time. It was big money, 80K, in 19... 85, yeah, but big money and, and gave it a little bit of turtles in Trangano. So my first task given is to actually uh, make a community survey uh, among the fishermen along the coast of Trangano that uh, try to collect the information which is known as the IUU now. Is <laughs> IUU now because uh, it's, it's very secretive for them to, you know, when they caught the turtle, they must kill it and put it back to the sea. So the turtle, the turtle died already. So it's very, very difficult to get that first-hand information from the local fishermen. In fact, we had to drink coffee with them, you know, uh, speak Terengganu language, dialect, you know, it's very, very, for the foreigner people who want to speak Terengganu dialect, uh, very, quite difficult. So happened that me, uh, Terengganu board, I managed to get through their their community and managed to, to get a lot of information on this uh, so-called incident, incidental capture of the sea turtles um, uh, using a various kind of gear, uh, fishing gears that time. So as Prof Chan said, we managed to publish a paper on uh, in 1988 on this. Until now, it's a very highly cited papers uh, in the WS, you know. Then uh, in the in biological conservation. <clears throat> so there's a challenge actually. We have to, as Dr. Dino said, we use a motorbike that time. And we go to the village, from, from village to the village, and from, <laughs> to visit the fishermen when they just came back from the seas and rest. Normally they have a small heart, but the sea's heart. Then uh, I managed to make interview with them and uh, record using a small tape that time. Huh? It's a tape recorder. So we, I didn't miss the, the information with that. Huh? Then come back home, uh, analyze the data and give it to Prof Chan that time. Then that is my challenge. Then of course, Prof Chan managed to write a paper uh, together and we managed to publish in 1988. That was my first international paper, international paper that, you know, uh, in my lifetime actually. <laughs> then my Actually, I would like to share a slide because I make it. Uh, it's quite difficult to get. Uh, never mind. Maybe not. Maybe uh, because you the slide. Click, yeah. You click uh, share slides at the bottom. Yeah, I, I already click, but and then you it, then you pick the screen pick the screen that you want to share. Yes, I know, but it didn't come out. Maybe uh, I pass to you, uh, Nick. Can you share? Uh, I have slide. Hold on one second. 
Yeah, because it's, it cannot really come out. Because yeah, that people, slide will, will, will tell everything what go, I'm going to talk later. Okay, um, you just keep going. Yeah. So, uh, my next challenge is, <laughs> this is very funny actually. Uh, we try to we try to keep the uh, leatherback hatchling uh, in the captivity. Yeah. Okay. okay. I can see. Yeah. All right. Maybe full screen. Oh. Yeah, that's full screen. Yeah, but uh, okay. Next, 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 next. Yeah, next. Okay, it was in 1986, as I said before. And then next thing. Then, uh, yeah, the first challenge is just to get the, yeah, yeah, uh, to get uh, to rear the the, uh, the baby hatchling of leatherback turtle in captivity. This is actually uh, the most, I think, you know, challenging work that happened in Serdang, UPM Serdang main campus, not in Terengganu. It was in Serdang that day. And uh, we, we, uh, we brought, uh, quite big tank, uh, about one ton, 10 in the laboratories and and take uh, sea waters from the Bordison that day. <laughs> Serdang is very far from the sea, so we have to take sea waters from Bordison, Negeri Sembilan, and we try to keep the baby hatchling of Ladebet Tata in captivity. But my most difficult challenge is to get them fit, actually. They refuse to fit until they die even force feeding we have to you know do it very careful manner to force them feed with the pellets of the goldfish that day we managed to we try to avoid them from dying so we try we have to force feed, force feed them but even that uh, they refuse to eat and die in fact and prof chan did so many way how to to get them feed uh, it's not like in green uh, green turtle. It will be very easy to get and feed, as compared to this uh, leatherback turtle. So that is my great challenge. Uh, I believe this one uh, we are fair to do this uh, until we have many batches trying in order to make it make them feed in captivity. But it's very very difficult until Prof Chan tried to emit the feed with the jellyfish using the jelly. I remember that day. <laughs> Ah, uh, but my 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 work with Prof Chan only lasts for uh, around nine months, I think, and I was I got offered to dig my uh, to do my masters in UK Newcastle upon time, uh, in you know in environmental science together with my supervisor at that time was uh, Professor Barbara Brown on coral reef. Then after I came back, uh, yeah. This is the net that uh, the picture that I tried I told you about the fishing gears. After I came back from my master, I joined UKM, where my earlier time with UKM, I continue my turtle work in Sabah. Of course, Sabah actually is a paradise in marine uh, research. Actually, so many resources. Therefore, I wonder why you know like Sabah very much. I think and Nick also back uh, stay in Sabah until now. It's a paradise to the scientists. You can dive anytime, you can climb the mountain, everything. But continuing turtle, turtle research is my passion that time, just to get my, you know, try to get my feel, my first feel with UPM. Then, um, where I met uh, Prof. Jin Otima, you know, he went to UKM campus in Bukit Padang. Remember, we I went you to the food store and we eat together, we discussed about this turtle, <laughs> together with Dr. Li Yan Chi that time. Then uh, we went to uh, Turtle Island, the so-called the Turtle Island Archipelago, the Silingan Island and Bakungan Kecil Island, where this is the I think the most uh, highly populated turtle nesting areas, and I call this as the Aribadas of Malaysia, as as you all know, the Aribada phenomena only happened in Costa Rica. Eh? Prof. Jimotimo, correct me if I'm wrong. Then Aribadas in uh, Costa Rica is similar to the one that Dino share, Prof Chang share on how it happened in Rato Abang when the leatherback turtle came in uh, to nest. Remember, eh? people coming in, jump on the back of the turtle and enjoy listening to music. And that happened to 
Costa Rica uh, beach Alibadas phenomena. So the one that in Sabah is quite different, where the turtle came out from the from water to the beach around noon time, not the night time, noon time, even one o'clock in the afternoon, it already full of turtle looking for the space to nest. And you can imagine when it comes to uh, around seven o'clock, you know, you even cannot walk, you know, full of them try to find space to nest the egg. That time, it was in 1990s, 89, 1990s, around that. So it, I call the Ivy Badas of uh, Malaysia because it's that time, it's very protected, it's very remote island, the island uh, in Selangor, bordering the Philippines. So not many, <laughs> uh, that time, not many tourists come in. You know, only Sabah Parks, the Sabah Park office were there uh, with the late Paul Basenta as a ranger that time. So uh, I think, yeah, uh, that time, I remember I worked with him because we did several experiments with Dr. Lianti by putting the data loggers, the temperature sensors in the nest and we managed to get some results and publish in Sabah and Sarawak Museum Journal that time. That's it with my turtle, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's the, my, actually my last touch uh, with the turtle before I migrated to, uh, to do research on fish, biology, and now I integrate with the climate change issue uh, in fish, you know, in captivity and also in uh, some uh, several marine uh, organism. Right, the challenge in turtle conservation to my personal opinion is now actually we got several, for example, climate change and adaptation issues, uh, coastal and offshore developments. This is the one that, you know, Prof. Chan mentioned about the offshore development, the oil rich development by the, you know, oil companies, the coastal development that, you know, distract their, their nesting, uh, you know, coming back to nesting place. Uh, development of the fishing effort and gears, the one that uh, we saw, even now fishery department try uh, make a very good effort to design uh, TEDs uh, and it can make a campaign to the fishermen so that they install the TEDs, the test cruising device to their trawl net. We, we try to make a campaign for the government to ban totally the trawl net, but it's going to take time. Even try to uh, make a campaign uh, to enlarge the cloth end also very difficult in Malaysia. We try to make 50 millimeters rather than 35 millimeters. Then the ocean pollution, now the issue of the microplastic and my, you know, macroplastic is very, very vulnerable to the, you know, not only the turtles, but also in uh, what from the other marine organism. And black market demand on consumption of turtle eggs. <laughs> uh, last, last week, uh, it was an issue uh, of the, you know, because of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, people cannot buy uh, cannot buy eggs in the market, so there are appears uh, the black market demand uh, no uh, offer in the Facebook you know, <laughs> to buy thirty eggs. So, <laughs> so uh, as a result, uh, last few days uh, the luckily the state government of Shanghai is is looking uh, to this matter and actually try to do something on you know. Uh, bending uh, the eggs that appears in the uh, in the market because during under you can still see the thirty eggs, uh, especially the the green thirty eggs, the yellow my, my dust and maybe hot spear or or lepidocalli uh, species thirty um, eggs in the market. So we hope that uh, this could be strictly controlled that we can we will see in the coming months, you know. So uh, I think that's all from me. Next, next. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, to share. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing those uh, early days. And um, yeah, it, it, so many challenges from, from way back when. Um, but it's great to see all of the work that's gone on as well. Um, Cole, I hope you don't mind me keeping you waiting to the end. Um, but after speaking to you the other day, I, I really thought that that story you had was was amazing. So I'd like to uh, to call on you now um, for everybody that's out there uh, tuning in online across the world and doesn't know. <laughs> um, Cole Limpus is chief scientist at the Queensland Department of Environment and Science. 
Uh, he's also an adjunct professor at James Cook University and the University of Queensland School of Veterinary Science. Cole's background is uh, wide and varied, having started out or at least at some point worked on sea snake venom, um, crocodiles, dugongs, and, and oh yes, uh, sea turtles for many, many years. His expertise is in the biology and reproductive ecology. Um, but if you ask me more on the population dynamics um, aspects of sea turtles, he's been uh, an incredible mentor to me. He's, he's taught me an amazing amount uh, and become a very good friend in the meantime. Uh, Cole has received numerous medals, awards, um, more awards than I've ever been even nominated to. So I, I congratulate you, Cole. And, um, and Carl, the, the world needs to hear what you've got to say. So over to you. Thanks, Nick. Um, well, I, I'll start off by introducing myself that um, I never intended to become a, a turtle biologist. Uh, it was an accident. Um, however, I grew up with turtles. Um, my first memories of, of turtles when I was five year old and my father took me down to the beach uh, where I grew up and, and uh, taught me how to find turtles, how to find turtle eggs that we took home to eat. And so that, that's been part of my life, being on the beaches with the nesting turtles uh, across the decades. Um, and then eventually I, I became a, a turtle biologist. Um, and as I... Um, explored the, the uh, published papers on, on sea turtles, um, I was left with a, a, um, a very strong opinion that Malaysia was one of the, the primary cradle areas for conservation of marine turtles in the world. Um, we go back to the, the 1950s and we have Tom Harrison um, in um, uh, Sarawak, um, who um, invents a tag uh, out of Monel that allowed um, turtles to be tagged and discover uh, the interval between breeding seasons that previously had not been understood, was able to demonstrate that turtles laid multiple clutches in a, in a season. And um, he, uh, with the, the limited information that he had available, instituted a process of protecting some eggs uh, to give um, a, a progeny for the next generation. And uh, we, we've often failed to appreciate uh, the significance of what he did. And uh, he also instituted a system whereby there would be um, a, a guaranteed funding for uh, turtle management and, and turtle conservation. And then we, we step over to Peninsula Malaysia in the 1950s and we have an American um, uh, fisheries biologist who, who got involved, uh, John Hendrickson. And um, his observations were that with the mass nesting that was going on with turtles in, in Terengganu, there were no hatchlings running down the beach um, because all of the eggs were being eaten. And so he became a, a, um, a champion of the concept of, we need to have some eggs being put into protection so that you can have the next generation. Um, unfortunately, um, the knowledge base that they had in those days um, was limited. They didn't have the, the depth of, of research that we've now got today. And they were basically working a lot of, of folklore and, and things like this. And I don't see it as a criticism of them. I want to praise them for their, their concepts of trying to look after the turtles. And um, uh, John um, uh, came up with the idea that you need at least two uh, out of every hundred eggs uh, surviving to maturity. And unfortunately, he translated that to 2% of eggs being protected. And unfortunately, that got embedded into the bigger folklore of management of sea turtles in, in um, uh, many countries. Um, and um, it took a long time to be able to change that. But you know, John was the person who, who brought this concept. Do we need to be protecting eggs for the next generation? And then we can step up in the 1960s to Sabah and we have Stanley De Silva uh, with the, the um, um, forest warden with the, the forestry department in, in Sabah. And um, he 
uh, had clear evidence of a declining population with um, excessive egg harvest. And so he didn't think in terms of let's protect a few percent. He decided that we'll take the major nesting beaches, the three turtle islands of, of Sabah, and we'll turn them into a national park and we'll have total protection rather than um, organized harvesting. Um, and he went beyond that. He actually put a 15 kilometer radius with no netting uh, in the waters. And this is the, the first anywhere in the world of, of looking at um, protecting turtles in the internesting habitat um, and um, um, contributing to, to our uh, attempts to, to manage them. Unfortunately, in those days, much of the knowledge was really folklore. And it's been in the, the subsequent generations that we've developed the depths of scientific understanding uh, to realize that we need to be protecting the majority of eggs. Uh, in fact, we, from where we are over in Australia, we're, we're advocating that at least 70% of eggs need to be um, uh, into your protected um, uh, hatchling production to, to ensure you can have sustainable uh, populations. But um, you know, the um, beginnings of uh, turtle management and, and a lot of the science actually starts over there in, in Malaysia. And it's a great credit that you folks need to um, recognize it and, and keep building uh, on it. My um, knowledge about Malaysia and turtles actually came to me at the beginning um, when I was about 10 year old and, and I read a, um, an article equivalent to something like National Geographic that had a story about the leatherbacks nesting in, in Ranta Abang. And that really caught my attention and, and was one of those places I flagged, I want to go visit this and see the, these giant turtles nesting. Back in the 1950s, Terengganu was the only place in the world where people knew that there were large numbers of, of leatherbacks nesting. We now know, of course, that there's other places. And it's sad that the, the management of that is um, gone such that, that we've got a population that is you know, on the verge of, of extinction. And um, um, it's, it's been one of those sad things for me that I had this great dream starting in 1950. And then in all my visits to, to Peninsula Malaysia, I never got to see a leatherback turtle because the populations had declined so, so far. Um, my contributions in, into conservation in your part of the world uh, really begin in, in the mid eighties um, when uh, I was a member of the IUCN Marine Turtle Specialist Group and the chair of the, the group, Professor Archie Carr um, recognized that um, there was a need for uh, international cooperation in the, the conservation of sea turtles. And um, he advocated uh, that the um, turtle populations nesting on the Sabah Turtle Islands and the Philippines Turtle Islands needed to be managed as a, a single unit uh, because of the attitudes towards the US that existed in the Philippines at the time. He felt it wasn't appropriate for a, a US um, biologist to go to the Philippines. And he asked me um, as someone possibly seen a little bit more neutral to, to go to the Philippines to start discussions with the Philippines government um, towards the idea of developing an ASEAN heritage park for the, the conservation of the Philippines, Sabah, Turtle Islands and the nesting populations. Um, and in the training work that I did in that visit, um, one of the uh, Filipino um, turtle um, biologists, Romy Trono, um, was there and, and um, um, participated in the training. I was impressed with his quality of his thinking and, and um, um, responses. Um, unfortunately, not long after I, I was running that, that work in the Philippines, the um, um, Philippines government went through a major change of, of leadership. Um, and uh, because the president's wife had been the champion of turtle conservation um, with the development of Task Force Poican, um, the new government cancelled all of the things that the Marcos government had put in place. And so their turtle program was 
ceased to exist in, in um, uh, about the beginning of, of um, 19, 1986. And Romney stayed around as a volunteer over a number of years. And then as government attitudes changed and they, they came back into turtle conservation, Romney picked up on the ideas that I'd brought in from the, the IUCN Marine Turtle Specialist Group. And um, he achieved something that um, was to me spectacular. He was able to um, persuade the, the government managers in the Philippines and in Malaysia to agree to look after the turtle populations there when the two governments could not agree as to who owned the islands, where the international boundaries were. And so we have the first ever international cooperative program for the conservation of, of sea turtles being developed in Malaysia in conjunction with the Philippines. And you know, that's a, a world first that you folks can be uh, so proud of. Um, it was while I was involved in that work in the, the 80s that our work with temperature dependent sex determination, we realized that hatcheries out in open sand were going to be biasing um, the populations to excessive females. And so um, I introduced into the, the management ideas of having hatcheries that had both intense shading to give you males and open sunny areas to have females. And that spread fairly quickly through the 1980s into the 90s throughout uh, Malaysia. And, and um, it was encouraging to see that um, injection of, of response uh, coming from the, the science information that was totally new for us in, in those days. Um, and I guess uh, the, the other uh, major contribution for me is that uh, during the 1990s, uh, early 90s, um, we had the opportunity to um, uh, get involved in in-depth population genetics of, of sea turtles. And in various trips that I took, um, I collected uh, tissue samples from uh, Terengganu, from Sarawak, uh, out of um, the Philippines and, and uh, Sabah. Um, and um, these uh, samples have been used and still being used today as new, new techniques evolve in, in uh, genetic analysis. And we were able to establish that the three green turtle populations of um, um, Malaysia, the, the uh, Peninsula Malaysia, the Sarawak and the Sabah greens are three independent genetic stocks that each have to be managed in their own right. Um, and uh, sadly, the genetic samples that I collected for the Olive Ridleys, we were able to demonstrate that that was a unique genetic stock for Peninsula Malaysia, different to any other population of Ridleys. And those are the only genetic samples we have for that stock. Um, and they're still being used in, in global analysis. So um, I guess I've, I've had a little bit of um, uh, contribution to, to understanding of sea turtles in, in Malaysia. Thanks, Cole, for, for providing that. And, and I think that it's important for everybody to realize just how how influential Malaysia was to the early days of, of sea turtle biology and research. Um, you know, picking up on, on things that Cole was saying, you know, some of the very early studies on tags and movements and migrations and things being conducted right here on our own shores. Uh, just just amazing. Um, I'm going to to uh, move on from this and get to some questions in a couple of seconds. Um, Cole, thanks ever such a lot. Thank you to all of you panelists for providing your, your time and your experience. Um, this wraps up the, the chat side of this afternoon. Um, I, found, I must say, I, I found everything extremely inspiring to think that there are people that have invested this much time and effort um, into doing what they do on behalf of sea turtles uh, not just in Malaysia, but but across the planet. And um, for you people out there, if you weren't inspired before, I, I certainly hope that these giants have set your imagination free to start planning and thinking and moving forward. Um, Chan, I got to say, it's a pleasure to hear of those early days in your life, um, challenges, young mother, lecturer setting out to do everything um, and doing as much as you managed to do. Uh, Dino, 
uh, thanks for sharing a lifetime's experiences and and for giving turtles hope in Malaysia where, where they most needed it. Um, Cole and Jean, your, your sort of external thoughts and expertise and, and helping Malaysia get to where it is today. Um, I know that there's, there's thousands and thousands of Malaysians out there that are grateful to you. And Prof Masan, I'm, I'm really, really glad you came home. I'm glad you re-migrated and came back to help us all out. Um, so now that we've heard from the giants, I'm going to open up the session for questions from our viewers online. Um, and I have a couple of questions already. So I'm going to pose the first one to all of you as panelists. Um, and and our, our reader has said, after witnessing the extinction of leatherbacks in Malaysia, are there any positive approaches that you can propose for turtle conservation from government support to public awareness? What is going to make a difference so that this doesn't happen again? I'd like to hear from any of you. I'll make the comment, Nick, uh, that um, if the local community that lives along the coast doesn't want to keep the turtles, you're going to have problems in um, being able to achieve the, the long-term goals. And, and I see it as the voice of the um, people uh, being a, a major driver in influencing government decisions, not just in Malaysia, but elsewhere. Um, and um, uh, as a starting point, um, um, a number of people, Chan and, and whatever, spoke about the need for education. And um, that, that's, I, I see that as a, an important thing to empower the um, people who, who live with the turtles to, to understand them and to uh, appreciate what's needed to, to keep the populations functioning into the future. Can I come on next? Yes, please. Um, yeah, I totally believe and agree with what Colin has said. Um, I also feel that government will is so very important. You know, the political will is so, so very important. Looking at the turtles. You know, we, do you know, you remember, it took us so long, you know, to try to get this, uh, you know, the, the, the federal government to put a ban on the sale of turtle eggs, but they did not take notice at all. So, so I, I believe that they do have an important role to play, and I hope that they will step into it soon. Okay, education definitely very important, and uh, I I can see that a lot of young people are doing that right now. Mm -hmm. um, we need more of all that, more. and of course we need funding for all that too. <laughs> okay, thanks. Anybody else? This morning, yeah, yeah, maybe oh, I can add uh, some more. Uh, this morning, as we heard, there are a lot, you know, young people dealing with, uh, talking on the river terrapine and also uh, turtles. And they, they mentioned a lot on the funding needed and they made a cloud uh, funding and generation and so on. That's very good. Uh, but I, I just want to share, you know, what happened in Sabah before. It was in nineteen in early nineteen nineties actually. You can find uh, thirty eight everywhere in the market. Uh, only ten cent per piece. Ten cent, I think. So uh, now it's very hardly to see the thirty eight in the market in Sanakan, unless people come to approach you and slowly talk to you. They offer you <laughs> uh, by the roadside. That happened now, uh, but they cannot sell the turtle egg openly in Sabah now and very glad you know uh, uh, how effective the campaign before met by WWF and many other agencies in Sabah. Uh, the, in Terengganu, uh, eating turtle egg is part of the traditional uh, cultural as, as Dino Shama said, Prof. Chan said, uh, the little bit turtle, the most expensive one actually, it's bigger size and the most expensive one and people look after the little bit turtle eggs way before and until you know uh, the state government uh, making a rule, no more selling of the leatherback turtle eggs in the market. But still, you can see the the green turtle eggs sold in the market openly. 
you know, but quite expensive, you know, uh, 20 ringgit for five pieces, five pieces. So those uh, today, but I, I hope for next coming month because uh, last few weeks developments, um, uh, the state government will, will do something on this. Maybe we cannot see, you know, no more to take uh, so in the Chengganu market, you know. So this is the, 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 the outcome, the result of what, uh, you know, the uh, thanks to young people continuing what we have done before, what, you know, uh, the, the guideline uh, laid before and the, and the Fishery Act uh, develops uh, for turtle protection and so on. So this is the one that uh, we, we, we would like to see more. But the challenge, bigger challenge now is, of course, the, the climate change, you know, things, that, the one that out of our control. Uh, it's a global issue that affects things. Uh, this, this kind of job, you know. As you can see, uh, last few months, uh, the orcas sighted nearby the uh, oil platform in Terengganu waters. Four orcas sighted. It was reported. Uh, in the news, when or in the papers, and of course, all cast is eating a lot. I believe so. <laughs> so this this thing, uh, you know, uh, the climate the climate change issues, you know, uh, is a, a great challenge for us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Do you know a couple of words? Yeah. So one of the things that used to get me very stressed as I used to walk the beaches uh, in many places was. Um, to see dead turtles ashore, yeah. So not just carcasses that have been hit by uh, boat propellers, but turtles that were tied with string to pieces of rock and stone. Uh, these were generally from ones caught in fishing gear, um, and uh, as you know, turtles generally keep moving forward and they get entangled. And when they haul onto the boats, they get whacked and they tie a stone. And eventually, the turtle carcass rots, it bloats, it gets washed ashore. And uh, so it, 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 it says many things. On the one hand, there was this issue about um, enthusing local communities about the need to, uh, whilst appreciating their tradition, the need to be involved in turtle conservation. So communities, as Carl said, is very important. And if they want, there's always a way to work with them. And if they don't, then your challenge just starts. But, but then beyond the beach, beyond the shore, where turtles move between nesting grounds and feeding grounds, was this risk of them getting caught in fishing gear. And, and for me, that was a, a bigger challenge. So, so it, it, it tells me that uh, a, a success story for turtles has many parts to it. One is obviously the nesting beach and the people that live in and around nesting areas. And their participation is pivotal to any success story. But also beyond the beach, there has to be international cooperation. And we struggle as a country to come on board the Indian Ocean Agreement for sea turtles. We struggle as a country to become a signatory to the Convention of Migratory Species, where we can draw upon uh, countries to help us understand uh, the need to conserve <laughs> common species. I mean, they could be nesting here, but they could be they are feeding elsewhere. And so these are shared species. Migratory species are shared species. Sure. So, so in summary, I think it's it's about understanding the the parts to the conservation. Turtles are, are migratory in many cases, and they are very complex, and it has to go beyond just the people and the communities. They are vital because that's the first step. Uh, because if we disallow recruitment to the population, that's a disaster, obviously. But then beyond the beach, it requires international and regional cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Gene, I have a question from you from uh, Roshan. And uh, he is, what is your advice to young sea turtle biologists? And in the next couple of minutes, all of you are going to hear that this is a resounding theme across many of the questions that were being asked. Um, my advice to sea turtle biologists in what sense? What, uh, <laughs> like how to become a sea, uh, yeah, how to become an old sea turtle biologist or? <laughs> what, what is your advice to young sea turtle biologists? I'm guessing that it's, what do we do? Where do we go from here? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I, I would suggest uh, if, a, if a young, you know, young sea turtle biologist need, this is someone who's already a biologist, you know, uh, or someone who wants to get into the field. I guess that's kind of two different questions, isn't it? it uh, if you're, if you're a, um, if you are already a sea turtle biologist, um, not sure, I'm not sure exactly what's the best way to answer that. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, I think you want to get out and, and uh, if you want to have an impact on people, I think you need to talk to people, try to in, uh, encourage, uh, you know, your communities to be interested in this. That will certainly help sea turtles. Um, and uh, one thing, you know, I've seen, I, I'm, I've, you know, done a lot of work here in Seychelles, especially, and, and it, it makes a, a, a big difference to get the, the children uh, on board. They talk to their parents and that can help to convince them to change things, maybe at another level. Um, I, I don't know if, does Chen want to come in on that? I saw her, her light up. <laughs> Um, uh, I must say that firstly, it isn't actually easy, you know, but um, you need to dedicate, you have to really dedicate your time, dedicate your life. If you really want to make a difference, you have to dedicate your life. Like a lot of us have done so over the years and you must be prepared to do that. And I feel that once you, you are in to it, you know, you have the passion, you really want to do this. Somehow or other, help comes along the way. That's how it has been for me, at least. A lot of things I never planned, you know, they just sort of like fell in place and have a passion, have a belief, you know, in what you do. And I, I think things will fall in place for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Cole, I have a question from you. Melissa would like to know. As a person who has eaten turtle eggs, how has that influenced your approach towards speaking or convincing, speaking to convincing people who consume sea turtle eggs to stop such a practice? You there, Cole? Oh, sorry, I didn't realize you were talking to me. Um, I had a, a message that came up and said my internet connection was unstable. Um, so, Shall I repeat the question? Yeah, please. Um, so Melissa would like to know, as a person who has eaten turtle eggs, how has that influenced your approach towards speaking to or convincing people who consume turtle eggs to stop such a practice? Okay. Um, Yes, I, I grew up in that environment uh, where uh, uh, turtles were, were seen as a, a food source for the local community. Uh, but as a, a turtle biologist, because of my work that deals with both nesting and, and foraging turtles um, and um, long term studies looking at um, how populations function and, and what is required to have a population keep functioning, um, it is very apparent that um, you can't take everything you you have to have um, if you if you want to use the resource you have to be able to um, put in enough uh, conservation effort to ensure the next generation can work and for the taking of, of turtle eggs uh, the work that we've done across several species is indicating that you need at least 70 percent of clutches successfully hatching if you want to have the next generation working now that doesn't mean to say you can take 30 percent of the clutches because there's going to be natural mortality through erosion or natural predators and so on. So if you want to take the eggs, then you need to become a competitor with the natural uh, processes out there. Um, and you're taking them rather than the ones that are being lost through erosion, but you're making sure you've got that adequate um, uh, production of, of hatchlings there uh, that, that keeps the population going. Um, Similarly, that, that our um, uh, research on, on the sort of uh, way populations function with adult mortality and things like this, what we're seeing is that if you increase adult mortality through some sort of human activity, if you increase the mortality by 5% or more, you will drive the population down. And so if we've got human induced mortality from entanglement in nets or um, from indigenous take or um, whatever, uh, then um, you know we run the risk of excessive loss that's going to drive the population down. And so if, if people are going to advocate for any sort of use of the resource, it needs to be based on really sound science, in-depth science. And if you don't have that, 
then then I have to recommend that the the goal has to be towards major protection of, of almost your entire population to build up depleted populations. Otherwise, it just won't work. Thanks, Cole. Very good. Um, I have a question from Jarina to uh, Prof Maslan. Do you miss working with sea turtles? You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I would like, you know, uh, to, but now we have a young, at UMT, we have a young researchers like um, Dr. Uze. Before we have Dr. Juanita, who already moved to Sabah now. Uh, she's Sabahan, so she wants to come back, re-migrant to Sabah. <laughs> uh, but we have uh, Dr. Uze at UMT, and I, as a Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, actually try to get as much fun as possible uh, to help uh, to assist the young researcher in turtles uh, doing their job at UMT. And as you know, uh, work from a uh, previous work from Prof Chan before, we have a very good sanctuaries uh, for Chelonia Maidas, you know, uh, in Chagahuta, Prof Chan's. Yeah, uh, where uh, yeah, we, we, we build out uh, very good uh, facilities there. And actually, we invite people over the world before COVID 19 uh, to join as a volunteer. Uh, you know, to 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 join uh, the Tertiary Research uh, Conservation Works at Chagahuta and Terengganu. Uh, but now COVID-19 is a rest time. Uh, we cannot do that uh, business as usual. And uh, we just uh, monitor them, uh, you know, uh, quiet place now in Chagahutan. So, so always try to help, you know, uh, the young researchers uh, in terms of funding them uh, using the internal fund of UMT. Uh, to help them to produce more, you know, uh, outcome or output uh, in this field of research. Yeah. Very good, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question that's going to go to the, to the panel. Um, it's from Sebastian. And what does the panel think about the recent news about a future ban on sea turtle egg sales in Trangano? Do you think this will move the trade underground? And um, what about enforcement? Is this enforceable? <coughs> yeah, maybe I, may, I, I may, maybe may, I can answer. Uh, yes, it's a good move actually, but uh, yeah, but uh, because of the enforcement, it's quite difficult in the market. Yes, but uh, for you know now with the high technology communication, in terms of you know when people can face, people can uh, WhatsApp maybe personal to personal. Uh, contact uh, and then they get uh, uh, because the concession must in control in terms of uh, you know uh, awarded still awarded by the fishery departments the concession the license certain people got the license and if you know now the the government have to overcome the community because they're going to a kind of uh, uh, replace the livelihood of the of the local community that depending on the turtle eggs selling so replacement of the livelihood is uh, something you know uh, take, uh, will take some time to to work on actually yeah do you know any thoughts from you on on that i know that this is something that wwf has invested yes. loads of energy over many years Yes, uh, thanks, Colin. So, just about to show a report, and I, I, you may be able to see it. Yeah, so this report is on total egg consumption. The study done in 2009 with traffic, the trade record analysis of flora and fauna in commerce, who were co actually commissioned through this work. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, the survey had sampled enough people who were you know, involved in the trade, so to speak, collecting, selling, eating, and so forth. And the results are quite alarming. I mean, there's only a fraction of people, we talk of livelihoods, really only a fraction of people uh, depend on the income they make from selling turtle eggs. Uh, so it is something that's, uh, that can be tackled, something that can be managed. So it's not about transforming an, an entire coastal community's livelihoods. It is a small proportion of people that are involved in the sale of the eggs, collecting and selling the eggs. Yeah? So it, it's... it's it, <laughs> It goes back to this 1993 report by Dr. Colin Limpus, it's political will. 
if there is a will, there's a desire to save uh, diversity, in this case turtles, then we appreciate that the complexity that may not, not, may not be unique to us. So we have the federal law, the Fisheries Act, that provide for turtle conservation. Then you have state laws. So un under the legislative framework, these are what we call on the concurrent lists. Yeah? There's, there are federal uh, uh, laws and then there's also state rules and regulations. So, so I want to tie this back into the question that was posed, what can young turtle scientists do? Uh, turtle biologists and turtle scientists who spend time studying doing science is fantastic and that must carry on. But we must ensure that social scientists get involved in our projects. People that have got expertise in social sciences, they can help us defrag the minds, the hearts and the wills of local communities. That's very important. We need people with uh, legal expertise to come on board our projects because they can defrag the complications of law. They help us understand the need to improve not just policies, but also actual laws and then rules and regulations. People with legal expertise who can work with legal advisors in, the, in these ministries, uh, relevant ministries and, and agencies. So uh, while the sciences must continue, uh, social sciences and people with legal and policy strength must, must bring their skills and expertise to, to form a more holistic conservation program. Excellent, thanks. Carl, do you want to say something? You're muted. Yes, Nick, I'd like to come back in and, and pick up on, um, I guess where I left off with Stanley De Silva's work in, in Sabah. And there's a really important message to learn that compare the three states and look at uh, Sabah putting in really strong conservation measures to reduce the, the excessive take of eggs um, in, in the, the uh, Sabah Islands and wait a generation and that population increases dramatically from a, a severely depleted population. Now we've had the same thing happen in the Seychelles where Jeannie's been working there, the turtles were being taken, not the eggs. And with the, the work that the genie did to introduce really strong measures to um, greatly reduce that, that uh, killing of, of the adult turtles and give it a few years and your population is, is increasing. And we have a number of examples around the world where we've been able to clearly see that when you put strong conservation measures into it to keep the majority of the population functioning, keeping mortalities low, the populations can recover. And, and I think that's an important message to take back. And, and you've got that, that good example within um, Malaysia about that uh, to, to um, um, take in. And, and if I wanted to give a, a, a message to a young biologist wanting to, be, to, to um, uh, get into to turtle conservation, get out on the beach and meet the turtles and work with the turtles and let the turtles teach you what the turtle biology is. Go find yourself a university that's doing research, find a community group that's doing active on the beach, work with the turtles and join them and work with the turtles, learn from the turtles. Sorry, thanks for that. We have a number of questions from a number of our followers that all relate to giving advice to new generations of conservationists in Malaysia. So as and how you speak, please keep that in the back of your minds. And, 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 and that's a generic thing across multiple requests from viewers online. I do have a question from Regine, who asks, how important is international collaboration for the conservation of sea turtles and how can young researchers be involved in pushing for that sort of thing as someone who is already a biologist? Maybe I'll take us words on, on this. So one of the challenges that we've been facing over the, the decades and maybe more pertinent in recent times because of ease of communication and transporting of eggs was a broad accusation 
that eggs that were sold in markets in Sabah, in spite of all the good conservation efforts, were coming from the Philippines. And uh, eggs that were being sold in Trangano were being accused of coming from Sabah. So, so there you go. So you've got uh, uh, broad accusations of eggs being uh, not originating from where they were being sold. And, uh, you know, um, and the challenge, I believe, uh, was the proof uh, in the court when people were actually caught, proving court that the eggs were actually uh, from a different source. So, so if you look at the way the laws work, if unless they have a blanket provision to protect eggs irrespective of the origin, one can get away by saying, well, these eggs are not from Trigano, they're from the Philippines or they're from Sabah. Yeah? Um, and so on and so forth. So, so, so people that are interested in solving this problem uh, the, the transboundary movement of turtle eggs, in this case, uh, illustrated by a small example, should try to defrag how turtles' uh, eggs are taken from one place and moved to the other. So monitor and study the trade routes, find ways to see whether we can determine where the eggs really originate from. There must be ways that they, we can determine that. If populations are very genetically distinct and discrete, we should be able to figure out some of those things. And then, and then apply the science of that and the trade route aspects to that and try and tackle the problem of uh, transboundary movement of turtle eggs. Uh, that would be a good thing to, to arrest once and for all, because this is proliferating until today. Sorry, Jean, you work across a large international region and saving turtles in the Seychelles didn't happen by only working in the Seychelles, but also by having networks of people outside of that. And it, it just made me think about Regine's question about international collaboration. Um, people on the panel, MTSG members, communicating across international borders all the time. Um, yes, there are things we can do at home, but I think that a lot of sea turtle conservation is rooted in international collaboration. So your thoughts? Well, you just okay. Now, now I'm, I'm, I think I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, well, when you talk about international collaboration, there's it comes at all different levels. Because uh, you have scientists collaborating together, and you know, in that way, we can understand um, you know the relationship between populations. For example, looking at the genetics, uh, looking at the migrations, where people are you know intercepting other people's uh, turtle tags, for example, or um, you know keeping com communicating between countries what what they're seeing in the region. Um, but then you also, of course, have, have international collaboration at a, at a national level where you have different countries uh, having a varying interests in protecting turtle populations. And of course, you know, one can argue that if you're protecting turtles in your country and people in, in the next country over are killing them, uh, that's a problem. Uh, so I think the, the, uh, you know, this collaboration needs to, needs to occur at, at various levels, but it's very important. Sorry, yeah, I'm trying, trying to multitask. I also wanted to, to talk about international collaboration with Chan. You know, right back in those early days, you were working with scientists from the United States and from Italy, um, all kinds of things. And, and that was done long before email was so readily available. How the hell did you manage to get that to happen? Um. I used to attend conferences and I met these people and they heard my presentation and they would come to me and say, hey, I think there's an area, you know, where we could uh, collaborate. I could come to your place in Malaysia, the Italians, for instance. So that was face-to-face -face, uh, meeting at conferences. So conferences did play a role in, in that respect. Mostly, yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks. Um, we have a, a series of questions that are all related to the turtle trade in Trangano, and I know we touched on that a little bit earlier. Um, so some of them are related. Do, do we think COVID-19 might have an impact on 
the sale of eggs uh, or the banning of the sale of eggs. And another one is if you had that 30 second opportunity in the elevator with a government official, what would we say to, to, to do something about the turtle egg trade? Any thoughts from panelists on these? Um, can I say something? Yeah, I think um, the government must come in, you know, and um, instigate a ban on the sale of the eggs, you know. So at least, you know, the um, you, you don't see it in the service. There could be things going on under counter and all that. And of course, those things have to be looked into as well. Now, when, um, let's say, Trangalnu uh, really, you know, instigates this ban on sale of the legs of all species, they have to look at other issues as well, you know, because as I know now, in Trungano, there are lots of nesting fishes. Some of them are not very major, but some of them are still being leased out to the local people for egg collection. So they have to tackle that. Because if not, then the eggs would still be available for sale. So it's not just banning the eggs, it's looking at the whole, the whole picture, you know, the whole process. And um, they have to do this. There's no other way. <laughs> yep. Carl, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was talking about a situation where you have a, a, um, a functioning turtle population and arguing for 70% of clutches to be you ensuring that you're getting hatchling production. But if you've got a severely depleted population, as you have for the remaining species in um, uh, Terengganu, you really shouldn't be planning conservation to main a, man, maintain a status quo. You should be main, uh, running a, a program to increase your population and build it back up. And in those circumstances, that's the situation when we're looking for approaching all of your egg production going into protected um, incubation in some way. And banning a sale doesn't achieve that. You need actions on the beach that are going to keep the eggs protected um, and ensuring that they can incubate successfully to produce hatchlings. These days with, with climate change impacts, we have to worry about having that mix of temperatures that will give us males and females, um, and um, that um, you've got to worry about the other natural processes of predators that, that might be out there and, and managing them to give you that high hatchling production. And you know, when you've got a severely uh, depleted population, there is really no other option but to get in and put maximum protection on the beaches to give you good hatchling production. Agreed. Anybody else want to touch on this before we move on? We've got 12 minutes and I've got four or five other topics that people are asking about. Um, I have a question for Cole and it might have a very simple answer. Is there a non-destructive practical way of sexing hatchlings? Um, at the moment, there might be, um, uh, uh, about two years ago, no, just over 12, 18 months ago, a, a, a research group in the United States um, uh, at the International Sea Turtle Symposium um, spoke about a, a technique using blood uh, from, from the hatchlings and being able to determine the sex. Um, the way they presented it looks very, very promising. However, as far as I know, the actual methodology underlying it is still not being published so that we can take it and replicate it. Um, I, I don't know whether it's a standard laboratory technique that sort of any university lab would be able to use or whether it's a highly specialized one. So we're waiting for that uh, to be um, uh, published so we can look at it. We, we want to apply it here in Australia uh, so that we can get better information on sex of hatchlings. In the meantime, we're using uh, a combination of sand temperature measurements, um, which will give us some prediction of, of uh, what a sex ratio could be, and the time of incubation from being laid to hatchlings leaving the nest. 
where with those two parameters, we can get a, an informed guess at what the sex is for the suite of hatchlings coming off that, that part of the beach at that time of the year. And, and uh, uh, that's the best non-destructive method that we've got to use. Thanks. Thanks, Cole, for that. Um, it was a very quick question, simple answer. I like it. Um, question on tourism. Uh, there's an expansion of uh, unregulated tourism around sea turtles. Um, how do people balance tourism and turtles in other places? Comments, thoughts? Jeannie? Go ahead. Uh, here, in, here in Seychelles, um, you know, we've had a lot of success with uh, increasing our populations. Uh, when I first came out to Seychelles in 1981, um, almost every turtle was being killed on the beach, uh, in, in especially hawksbills uh, throughout the islands. And over time, the government started to realize that, um, for Seychelles at least, um, the environment was a draw for tourists and that this is why people, people wanted to come to Seychelles to see a beautiful environment. And so for us, tourism has actually been a friend to sea turtle conservation because um, a lot of our tourism is high-end tourism. So you don't have huge numbers of people on the beach. And so, you know, this makes it easier because, you know, you have people with a lot of money, they come out to an island, uh, there's not that many of them and they help to pay for, you know, our conservation programs. Uh, Malaysia, of course, is a much more complicated situation where you have just more people in general and people who want to go to the beach, you know, have the po you know, potential to, to disrupt turtles. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering to what extent, you know, uh, you can sell tour, uh, turtle tourism in Malaysia uh, to help the turtles. And, and I, I'm not in a good position to answer that, but maybe someone else is. All right, thanks for that. Um, anybody else want to comment on this topic? We have a couple of minutes left to touch on things. Yeah. Just a quick one, uh, Nick, quick one. So if you if you were to look at the heyday of uh, leatherback nesting in Ranta Abang and the tourism and the infrastructure that was built, the chalets and so on and so forth, uh, it was very complicated because it was uh, both foreign and local tourists. A lot of foreign tourists generally in the main more aware about the need to help protect conservation. So they felt that their tourism dollar was being spent for conservation purposes. But a lot of local tourists that came from uh, in-country, but also from Singapore, uh, combined their tourism visit with uh, the need to want to eat turtle eggs as well. So that was a bit of a challenge, yeah? Uh, and, and sorry to say, but also a lot of uh, bad behaviors, wanting to sit, take pictures with flash photography. So a lot of harassment. And I remember in the early days, the challenge was how to help uh, create a, an, an opportunity for people to regulate the tourism, regulate tourists, so that the interaction between the nesting turtle and the tourists was something that was hopefully less detrimental to a, to a female turtle nesting on a dark beach here. Yeah? And it was a nightmare and a challenge, as I recall in the, in the days. Yeah, and uh, I think I would also add, just to add to that is that today, there is so much more knowledge on the biology and, and the ways turtles react to outside stimuli that, that tourism programs can be designed a lot, lot more efficiently. All right, just a couple of things to touch on before we call it quits. Um, one of our followers says that fishing boats are killing sea turtles by the hundreds and how do we get NGOs to pressure Department of Fisheries Malaysia to implement something like turtle excluder devices? Thoughts? Prof. Chan and, yeah. and uh, yeah, hey, Colin, I think with respect to turtle excluder device, you are the best person to answer the question. You've been doing so much work on these. Would you care to? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll make the, the comment that um, the reticence by the fishermen to use them is um, usually because they're scared that the, the um, escape that's allowed for the turtles and stingrays and the like would be allowing the, the shrimp, the prawn, to be able to escape as well. 
Um, in Australia, we were very, very fortunate that um, the um, fisheries management agencies um, worked with, with uh, fishermen and um, actually did controlled experiments on, on um, um, actual trawling vessels and were able to demonstrate that when they weren't catching turtles in the net, the prawns that they were catching weren't broken as much as they, they are when you've got something big struggling in amongst all your prawns and, and breaking them up. And they found that the overall catch of prawns was actually higher value when they weren't having turtles in the nets than they were um, when you, you were catching things like turtles and sharks and, and whatever. And we saw the, the um, fishing industry um, come on board because they saw it as an economic benefit to them to have a better quality catch. Um, and um, um, it made it very acceptable then when the government legislated and made it compulsory that all of the trawlers operating in, in Northern Australia, Eastern Queensland and so on, had to use turtle exclusion devices, um, that it was the exceptional fishermen that didn't come on board. And we have fishermen today saying if they took the legislation away, we'd keep using them because we have a higher value catch when we don't have something breaking up the catch and giving us a, a poorer quality uh, product to sell. Thanks, Carl. That's uh, very, very useful. I'm, I'm cognizant of time, and I, and I, and I really want to honour as many people that have paid attention to all of this for the last two hours. Um, one question we have is: some people feel that protecting eggs without head starting is futile, and that head started sea turtles would not affect their imprinting ability or survival. What is your opinion on this? No, daunting. Uh, I'll come in. I um, mean, I'm I'm one of the few people that's actually run a an experiment to look at how many hatchlings actually survive to adulthood. How long do they take to grow up to adulthood, and um, um, do they come back to the beach where they're born? And you know, if you want to have an adult turtle coming in to lay eggs, then you need to be putting out somewhere between 500 and 1,000 healthy hatchlings into the sea so that at least one of them is going to survive as a turtle to come back as a nesting female. So you want to look after your nesting population. If, if you've got um, uh, 200 nesting females, um, then um, you, you want to replace them um, in some decades time when they're due back, then you need to be putting out a couple of hundred thousand little turtles uh, out there. Uh, and most of the head starting programs can't cope with that volume. They're really just little bits at the edge and, and they're just not on a big enough scale to make it work, assuming that the husbandry for rearing them for however long, whether you want to wear, rear them for a month or six months, that you don't end up with disease issues that are, that are going to um, uh, destroy the the goal of what you're trying to achieve. Jean, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, if I just want to make a quick um, comment. Uh, there's really been no evidence anywhere that head starting turtles has helped a population. But we know we have lots of evidence that protecting turtles on the nesting beach and letting them lay their eggs and letting the eggs go out to sea yeah. has definitely increased populations. We have examples yeah, of that all over the world. And so, uh, you know, whereas we have no evidence that head starting uh, helps. Um, and there's, and as Carl said, you have disease problems. We don't know about imprinting, whether they're going to imprint on the beach properly, whether they're going to be able to, how well they're going to be to survive. And you just, you can't produce enough hatchlings to make it have an effect. Turtles do uh, reproduction really well if you let them do it. And uh, that's what I would recommend. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Okay, last question. And it goes back to our Malaysian team. Uh, and it has to do with change. Do you think public awareness towards sea turtle conservation has changed over the years? Uh, and is this going to give marine turtle conservation a boost? 
Yeah, so I'll chip in. I think it has to be to be to be very honest and direct. Uh, a lot of the work that has happened through uh, the work of government, fisheries department, and the various NGOs, um, I think has had an impact on people. More people understand uh, that first of all we have turtles, and there are very specific places where they nest. They understand some of the challenges with coastal development having an impact on these turtles. A lot of people, uh, uh, because they know, uh, don't participate in eating turtle eggs. It's all well and fine. Uh, but then there will always be people, a small fraction of people, that are always looking out for a resource like, like turtle eggs to eat and enjoy. Yeah? Uh, because they're from an older generation or they've been told stories about it. But in the main, generally, awareness is on the increase. But we now must take the next step to get all these good and well-intended people who are now aware to come on the bandwagon to advocate for, for better turtle conservation, more sites to be protected and uh, enforcement of the laws. And so, so we need voice. We need voters to speak up uh, and provide voice behind the good efforts of government and uh, NGOs. Perfect. Prof Maslan, last few words. You're muted. Yeah, it's same as what uh, Dr. Did, you know, said. Uh, for the Tunganu people, actually, uh, it will take, uh, for example, it will take some time for them to not completely to eat the turtle eggs. You know, uh, it will take some time. And of course, the state government have to play a very, very important role uh, in order to control the, you know, uh, this uh, condition, actually, on the community side. Where if you uh, actually there's going to be a new research uh, going to be done by UMT on the community-based uh, uh, conservation efforts, you know, in Pulau Redang, because it's associated to uh, uh, Chagahuta Sanctuary uh, in 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 Terengganu. So uh, with the 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 latest move by the state government, uh, I would say that no thirty eggs in the market, you know, uh, coming uh, months. So that is, I think, a good starter uh, to just like in Sabah, you know, when it's not today in, in, in the market now in Sabah, Sabah, uh, following Sabah very soon, and of course with the young lecturers now is uh, is a very very you know uh, interesting to see them you know uh, publishing more papers, research paper, documented papers uh, in this field of research in many aspects. Uh, nowadays, you know, through this internet, uh, new technologies, AI, uh, access in data is very, very simple and quick as compared to our time, last time. It's very, very difficult. We have to go to the library and go to the microfilm, <laughs> search for more information. And as, as Prof. Chan said, have to uh, seek for the interlibrary loan uh, from UK, from everywhere in the world. And it takes months to get, you know, in order for the paper to arrive for us to read and digest the contents. So those things uh, are no longer, you know, now, nowadays they are very simple, easy to get more information, you know, easy to contact people, to exchange ideas and so on. Like here, you know, what we have done now, it's, it's a very good platform for us to discuss. Okay, that's, uh, yeah, that's for me. Excellent. And just a couple of last words from you, Chan. You're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Sorry. I think the general perception of, of turtles, you know, for, for marine turtles as well as freshwater turtles, um, it has improved over the years, definitely. But uh, we still need to do more public awareness work. Because as long as there are still people who want to eat turtle eggs, who want to buy turtle eggs through Shopee or whatever, there still is an urgent need to expand uh, awareness programs. I feel it's never enough. All right. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for staying with us for all of this time. Um, I, I've got a couple of words that I, that I hope will, will summarize some of the, the words of wisdom. And, and they, they include things like involving local communities, perseverance, uh, dedication, passion, education, government will, 
funding, controlling fishing. These were some of the things and topics that came out and stood out to me as being things that, that sort of define our panelists this afternoon. Um, and, and so that brings us to the end of the panel. And on behalf of Society of Conservation Biology Malaysia chapter, um, and particularly to our technical team, Seling and Health, and, and all of those working behind the scenes to make this whole electronic uh, webinar a reality. I'd like to thank all of the panelists for sharing their time and their lives with us this afternoon. And I'd like to thank all of you who've tuned in from around the world and have paid attention to, to all matters related to sea turtles. I hope you're inspired. I hope you feel like you're better informed and that this was a good use of your time. And I hope that sea turtles will all be better off for our shared wisdom from now onwards. Um, panelists, if you'd stay online for just a couple more seconds and we can all wave goodbye to our YouTube followers. Thank you very much, guys. Bye.